Hey, thanks for watching another episode of Answering a Call. I'm Pastor Chuck Reese, your show host and executive producer. This is a series all about evangelism and discipleship, and we're serious about highlighting ministries that are doing that all around the world. Our next story comes from Tulsa, Oklahoma, Wings of Freedom. With me is the founder, the CEO, Pastor Dixie Pebworth. Pastor Dixie, thank you so much for spending some time with our viewers. Thanks for having me on, Chuck. Appreciate it. You have an amazing story. You know, we started talking about the Lindell Recovery Network and your testimony and the work that you're doing here in Tulsa. But tell our viewers a little bit about how God put it on your heart to even start this ministry. Well, Wings of Freedom is a sober living community. And what we try and do is help people to heal their broken hearts, to bring deliverance into them, open blind eyes, and restore their lives. And it all started back whenever I was basically raised in Oklahoma City. I started smoking marijuana when I was 10 and drinking when I was 12. And by the age of 14, I was in trouble with the law. And by the age of 15, I dropped out of high school. And then by the age of 18, I was sentenced to two years in prison. And all I did during that time was change my profession. I went from stealing to support my drug habit to dealing in drugs. And so when I came out of prison, whenever I was 20, I, I started selling drugs. And first off, it just started with marijuana and maybe a little bit of LSD. But then it got on into cocaine and methamphetamine. And my front door wow. began to be like a Walmart center. Wow. I became a man I really didn't want to be. I, I was broken. I was angry. I was bitter. I was resentful. And my life uh, I was going down a path that I really didn't like. And uh, on March the 15th, uh, or I'm sorry, March the 5th, 1987, uh, I just left my house to go score some more drugs. And uh, I went down, I stopped at a corner store, went in, got a six pack of beer and two pack of cigarettes, came walking out, and I noticed a cop car squalling around the corner. Behind it, another black and white. Behind it, another suburban and a van. I, in my heart, I knew where they was going. I walked over to a pay phone, called my house, had a guy by the name of George answer my door and answer my phone. I said, George, I don't want to scare you, but I want you to look outside and tell me where those 10 cop cars just went and came flying around the corner. Wow. He lays the phone down, and all of a sudden, bam, I heard the door kick open. I heard the guns clicking. I heard the cops screaming. Then I heard my wife scream, who was in the house at the time. Yeah. I heard my oldest son, who was two and a half years old, wow. and I heard him scream. And then my mind went back to my seven-day-old son wow. that had just been brought home from the hospital. Yeah. All my hopes and dreams was in that house. Everything I desired was in that house. And you're watching it from across the street unfold. Uh, exactly. That's well, crazy. I'm listening to it on the phone. <laughs> I was down it. the street, <laughs> yeah. and I was listening to it on the wow. phone, and it just totally... Wow. It, it was the first time in my life I ever realized yeah. I had destroyed my life. Wow. My struggle is I didn't know how to be a father. I didn't know how to be a husband. Yeah. I didn't know how to live life. I was right. never trained growing up. I started drugs and alcohol at a very young age. And I was basically raised by the streets. And in that, that moment was the time that changed my life forever. You would have thought that I would have quit at that point in time, but I didn't know how to do anything else. Uh, afterwards, the police didn't take anybody to jail. They just wanted me to turn myself in the next day. Whenever I did, they wanted me to set up five control buys, and then they'd let me go. Wow. And I refused to do that at the time. Uh, they locked me up, filed charges against me. And uh, at that time, it took my wife about two weeks to get me out of, of jail. And I went right back into selling drugs because I had to raise money to buy a lawyer. Yeah. And I felt like I would try and fight the charges and beat the charge. I took it to jury trial. And on October the 7th, 1987, I was found guilty in a jury trial uh, of three of the four charges. The jury recommended 30 years for possession of cocaine, 40 years for possession of a weapon while in commission and committing a felony, and 10 years for possession of a firearm after former conviction of a felony because I'd already been in trouble with the law. Wow. And uh, the judge had an option to run it concurrent or yeah. run it consecutive. Yeah. And so they locked me up in the Oklahoma City County Jail. And I was sleeping on the floor with the rats and the cockroaches, the lowest point in my life. Yeah. I had voices in my head telling me to just kill myself and check out of this world. I'd never be a father again. I'd never be a husband. I'd never be free again. And for five days, I laid there thinking about that. And then on October the 12th, 1987, uh, about 7 o'clock at night, a Baptist preacher came storming through the door. And the first words out of his mouth, I come here to tell you God loves you. Right. And that love spoke to my heart. It wasn't about religion. It wasn't trying to condemn me and send me to a lake of fire. He just told me about the love of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. And that night I went forward with tears screaming down my eyes and I gave my life to Christ. Wow. And uh, the next day he brought me a Bible and some Bible studies. But every time I opened up the Bible, I, it was about God's love. 
It, it wasn't about religion because I didn't know what religion was, but it was about God's love reaching out to me to change my heart from the inside out. And from then on, my whole life began to change. On December the 2nd, 1987, I was sentenced to 80 years in prison. Wow. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, believe me, it was a radical. <laughs> yeah. And obviously you didn't do 80 years in prison. So No, was... I actually didn't. Uh, to me, prison became my college. Uh, you know, most people go to a six-year degree, eight-year degree in college. <laughs> I did six years, three months, and 17 days in prison. Yeah. And uh, But it was my school. Uh, first thing, I got my GED. Then I went through business college. Then I went through Bible school. Then I went through Votech. I did everything I could to change my life because ever given a chance to get out, I wanted to make sure I wouldn't go back. Uh, my wife and my two sons were still waiting for me out in the free world, and I wanted to do my best to learn how to be a father, learn how to be a husband, uh, learn to do the right thing. And God transformed my life during those six years, three months, and 17 days. And it was a miraculous. God moved in mighty ways, uh, performed miracles in my life to set me free. I tell people all the time, God loved me so much, he rewrote the law in the state of Oklahoma just to set me free. Wow. Yeah, that's just amazing. So I've heard it said a million different ways. Your misery becomes your ministry. Yeah. So God pulls you out of the muck and the mire, puts your feet on the ground, mm -hmm. on a solid rock. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, talk about the gospel and, again, how God is using that to, you know. To, well, to in, in 1999, or actually in 97, I started going back into the prison, sharing my yeah. testimony. I had a great impact. Yeah. And one of the things that happened was I noticed that when guys were coming out, they didn't have no place to go. Uh, they had burnt their bridges with their families. They didn't have a place to, you know, live whenever they got out. Uh, they would come and ask me if they, you know, ha if I had a place to help them. At that time, I didn't. In 2001, I had a spiritual father of mine that had a four-story building and had 27 units in that uh, four-story building. And he gave me the set of keys to the building and says, here, start your program, and when, it, when the money comes in, pay me rent. And my only requirement is start with women and women with children because they have the, the hardest time finding a safe place to go where they're not used and abused. So in 2001, we started Wings of Freedom. And then in 2003, we started our church called God's Shining Light. And in 2003, I had a guy come in with a, a three-bedroom, two-bath house nice. and said, here, I see what you're doing with the women's program, start, a women, start the men's program. And when the money comes in, pay me. And so in that, we just started growing. Right. Uh, it was based on healing the brokenhearted. It was yeah. based on uh, setting the captives free, helping a person restore their lives. It's a hand yeah. up. It's not a hand down. Right. Uh, we're trying to teach people to fish, trying to teach people how to survive in society in a right way. Uh, over the years, we've helped men and, 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 and men with children, women and women with children. And then we realized when we got our first set of apartment complexes that we could help families and families with children, uh, married right. couples. Right. And so God began to escalate it and let it grow uh, to the point today we have, you know, over 100 apartments that we manage and we create sober communities. Yeah. And, and it's a place where we control the environment and it's conducive for them to heal. It's conducive for them to be restored and put their lives back together. And yeah. then we give them boundaries and we give them disciplines to follow. Yeah. And God has used it in a mighty way. We, yeah. We've touched thousands of people. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, we know addiction and recovery is just a big uh, topic. And there's a lot of 30, 60, 90 day models. And then there's your long term nine months, you know, 12, 15 months, some people teen challenges and stuff. And, and then there's that transition. And I love when you talked about that, that some people just aren't ready to live in low income housing areas where those temptations oh, are yeah. living right next door. So mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about that. I mean, you well, know, there's a we process. Well, yeah, we used to have time limits on our, on our, on our clients staying with us. <clears throat> and then there was this time whenever I had this lady and she had to leave. She had been there for nine months, and it was time for her to go out in the community. And the only place she could find to live was a low-income housing program uh, that really wasn't being super, supervised properly. And within 30 days, she was calling me and begging me to come back to our apartment complex. And I asked her, I said, okay, I don't want you to be dependent on me. Why do you want to live in our apartment complex? And she said, Pastor Dix, there's one thing I know about your apartment complex. I'm not going to have a drug dealer living 
living right next door trying to get me high every time I leave my apartment. Right. I'm not going to have this alcoholic down the street trying to get me drunk and take advantage of me every time I leave my apartment. Yeah, and yeah. so at that point in time, I told her to come on home. Right. And she came back home. She came back to Wings and stayed for another two years with her and her daughter and until she was able to afford to get a nicer place and a place that wasn't in low-income housing. Yeah. And I watch her on Facebook all the time. I watch her daughter just yeah. recently graduated. And whenever nice. she was living here, her daughter was like you know, 10 and 11 years old. Right. And so God really has blessed her. But it, had we not had a safe place for her, right. there's no telling what would have happened. Yeah. Uh, because whenever you're out there all alone, fighting that addiction, right. you, you, it's hard to do it all by yourself. Yeah. But when you create a community and a support system around you, right. it empowers you yeah. to go to the next level. Right. And that's discipleship. I mean, Jesus <coughs> sent them out two by two. And these are grown men that have been hanging out with them for, you know, yeah. for a while, yeah. for a few years. And, and, you know, it's just not good to be alone. It's not good for man to be right. alone. God said that before you even made woman. It's mankind. But, mm -hmm. you know, accountability and, like you said, a support system, that's just super huge. Mm -hmm. And um, God's timing is always perfect, right? So you can't rush to process, and it's certainly not a cookie-cutter approach. Right. No, you can't do that. A, a lot of people, they try and use, like, treatment, drug treatment and stuff, and it's a cookie-cutter approach where everyone's got to go through the same system. But it doesn't yeah. work like that. Right. What I have found is when people get their hearts broken, and they just may be using drinking or, or drugs for a social event, but once they get their heart broken, they dive into their addiction. Right. And then they lose control. And it's because of that broken heart. It's because of that trauma. It's because of that loss. It's because of that broken relationship that they just dive deeper into addiction. And as you begin to heal that broken heart, they begin to come into the light. They, become to, they yeah. begin to come out of it. Because nobody wants to be a drug addict. Nobody wants to be an alcoholic. The problem is people get stuck and they don't know how to get out of it. Right. Whenever we began the church, God dealt with me about where could he take someone with a broken heart yeah. and begin to heal them. Yeah. We've had people come into our church that was homeless for 18 years. And for the first you know, year, they would come to church totally drunk. Uh, and because they, they was coming, but they never caused a scene. And that's one of the ways I could tell that God was bringing them for deliverance. Because the best place for deliverance is through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. And yeah. the healing that comes from it. Yeah. And I told the guy, I said, keep on coming. No matter what God's working in your life, keep on coming. As long as you never cause a disturbance, I will never remove you from the service. He said, I'd never cause a disturbance, Pastor Dixie. And I said, <laughs> okay. When you keep on coming, let love right. Right. touch your heart. Yeah. Well, then he came up to me and said, I want to quit drinking. And so we anointed him with oil because we believe in the word. And, and the next thing I know, he comes up 30 days later and says, I want to come to your program. And I said, well, you can't drink in my program, Gary. And he says, I haven't drank in 30 days. And wow. I said, well, praise the Lord. Yeah. And so he moved into our program. He's still living in our program today. Yeah. And it's been a great blessing. Yeah. Uh, he's, you know, turned his life around to the best of his ability. But kind of find out he had an entire family. Right that he turned and walked away from because of his use of alcohol. Right. And he never could get back in their lives because he was always drunk. Right. And But God brought a healing into his life. And, you know, a lot of churches, you know, they, if someone comes in drunk, they want to run them off. But yeah. where, where can God take them? Yeah. And, and which is better, yeah. a treatment facility or, God's, or the gospel, the church house? I, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's, I was thinking that as you were just talking. There's just probably a lot of churches uh, love what you do, but don't do it in my backyard. Exactly. You know, there's a lot to talk about. And, you know, we, we do make a pretty church, and they obviously feel like a fish out of water. They don't feel like they fit in. So, like you said, it was God drawing them to, to sit in. I wish, I wish all churches were inviting. And technically, you all say they're welcome, but does everybody really feel comfortable in a room? When, when well, and it's like very that? difficult. You know, so I don't, I don't preach with a tie. I mean, I'll wear a tie for a wedding or a funeral, and I'll respect people when it's needed. Right. But I, I dress, you know, just down right. to the point is I want people to feel comfortable. Right. One of the things God told me about people is that they got to hear the gospel right. before they can begin to be drawn by it. Right. And, and, you know, the Bible says in Romans 2, 4, it's the goodness of God mm -hmm. that draws people to repentance. And it's not the fear of God. It's the goodness of God. Right. When we mercy, learn the yeah. fear of the Lord, it's then nice. we begin wisdom and knowledge and understanding. But right. it's not fear that brings people to God. Right, right. It's faith. It's love. It's hope. Right. It's the hope of a, uh, of a better life. 
And when people can see that in action, right. then they start changing their lives. That's just like someone coming out of prison. Amen. You know, they're, they're scared to death to come out of prison, but they don't know where to go. And they don't have no place to go. And what we try and do is give them a, a, a platform that they can begin to rebuild their lives. And we protect them from the world until it's time for them to face the world. Right. Right. And, and, and that helps transform their life. I've helped people coming out of prison. I had one guy did 49 years in prison, wow. Chuck, and it, it, he didn't know what to do. We took him to Walmart. It was like Wally World experience. He was scared to death. Wow. I had one guy that did 37 years. I had a lady who did 17 years in prison. Yeah, you've been doing this for 20 years. Been doing it for 20 yeah. years, yeah. There's a lot to talk about. We'll take a break, and uh, okay. we'll come back. But I uh, just want to encourage you to stay tuned. We've got a lot to talk about evangelism, discipleship, what it means, where the rubber meets the road, helping people be restored get wings of freedom, and uh, keep watching. We're going to talk a little bit more about what God is doing here in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and how you can play a part and get involved and answer the call. Tune in to Overcomers TV on your favorite app or streaming platform. It's time to overcome. How would you like to partner with Overcomers TV? Become a ministry partner, spreading the good news about your ministry and Jesus Christ. We're selecting ministries for upcoming episodes of Answering the Call. We can also help you produce your own show. Partnering with us is easier than you think. Just visit our website, overcomerstv.live. Be an overcomer today with Overcomers TV.